You, you, you guys make perfect sense. Jesus dying on the cross for your sins to save you, that's anathema, but a white stone sucking up your sins and turning black from your sins, absorbing your sins so you can be forgiven, that makes sense. Oh, wow, I'm ready to take shahada. Okay, now, go to chapter 2, verse 230 of the Quran. I want to show you something else. And I got more on the Trinity Old Testament. I'm just giving you something for you to pick because I don't want to overwhelm you. You can call me back tomorrow. Other day we'll go more in depth on the Old Testament. But go to chapter 2, verse 230 of the Quran. So I'll back to you. Uh... They ask you about uh on us two twenty two Okay. Uh, yeah, it's gonna talk about when you divorce a woman. Chapter two verse two hundred thirty. Uh, yes, um and if he has divorced her for the third time, then she is not lawful to him afterwards until after she she marries a husband other than him, and if the latter husband divorces her or dies, there is no blame upon the woman and her former husband for returning to each other. If they think that they can keep within the limits of Allah, these are the limits of Allah, which he makes clear to people who know. Okay, so notice, if I divorce my wife, the only way I can take her back, if she goes and marries someone else and has sex with him, and he divorces her or he dies, then I can take her back, right? Reread and see yes. that's what it's saying. The one who makes my former wife lawful for me is called muhallal. That's the technical term, muhallal. So notice, if I divorce my wife. She's got to remarry and have sex and be divorced or that husband die for me to take her back. Otherwise, I can't take her back, right? Yes. Okay, now go to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 of 4. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 of 4. Twenty-four, twenty-four. No, twenty-four verses one to four of Deuteronomy. Watch this. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. Or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land, so can uh, I ask upon the land, the Lord. Okay. Why is your God Allah doing what is disgusting to the God of Moses? Did you see the contradiction? The God of Moses says, if I divorce my wife, she marries another, and he divorces or dies, I better not take her back. That's going to defile the land. The God of Muhammad says, hey, if I divorce my wife, she better get married and have sex in order for me to take her back. So mm -hmm. why is your God contradicting the God of Moses? I never noticed it. I'm going to give you another one. Go to chapter 4, verse 24, and then I'll wrap things up because I don't want to overwhelm you. Go to chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran, Quran Surah An nisa chapter 4, verse 24. And then I'm going to give you a link so you don't take my word for it. Hold on. Let me get you there. So, yeah, read it for me. Let me get there. Also forbidden are married women except female captives in your possession. This is Allah's commandment to you. Okay, did you, to you. Okay, hold on. Read that again slowly. Just the first part. I need you to read one more time. Also forbidden are married women except female captives in your possession. So wait, married women are forbidden for you to have sex with, right? Except female captives. Oh, yeah. so if I take a female captive, even though she's married, your God is saying I can have sex with her, right? Yes. Okay, now, I'm going to read the hadith. Sunan Abu Dawood, I just gave you the link. I posted it in the Skype, and I posted it here. This is Sahih narration. Sahih. 
Sheikh El Albani. Let me read to you the historical context. Are you ready? Yes. Sunan Abu Dawood in English is 2150. Abu Sayyid Al Khudri said, The Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Autas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have relations with the female captains because of their pagan husbands. So they're still married. Their husbands were there taken captive. So they didn't want to have sex because they're embarrassed. So Allah, the exalted, sent down the chronic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hand possess. That, this is to say they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. So your God says to Mo Muhammad, hey, you take a woman captive in war and she's married, you can have sex with her. She's your property. doesn't matter her husband's alive. Then you can sell them off. Now let me be, ask you an honest question. If the Muslims were to attack us today, just let's say hypothetically, whatever your view of jihad is, doesn't matter, just for this argument. The Muslims attack your city, take you and your wife captive, and the Muslim man has sex with your wife. Number one, would your wife be okay with it? Number two, would you be okay with it? No, of course not. But this is what your God has sanctioned, and he never abrogated it. Now let me compare that with the God of Moses. Go to now Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21 and read 10 to 14. A law given 2200 years before your prophet. 2200 years before your prophet. Look what the true God tells Moses about women who have taken captive. Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 14. Okay. Man, female captives. When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God gives them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured, and shall remain in your house, and lament her father and her mother a full month. After that you may go, into her and be her husband. Wait, wait. And she Can you just have sex with her or you must then marry her and be her husband? You must be her husband. And yeah. she will be your wife. Yeah. Now finish it. Go all the way. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants, but you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave since you have humiliated her. So wait, what do you do for her? You should marry her. And then if you dislike her and you divorce her and shaming her by divorcing her, do you then sell her like property, like chattel, or you let her go free? Uh, you would let her go free. So why is the law of Moses superior to the law of your God when Moses' God said, you cannot rape captive women, especially married. If there's a woman that you've taken captive, you give her time to mourn, let her shave her head and pair her nails because that will also give her time to mourn because that's a sign of mourning, but it does something else. Just in case you were lusting for her, when she shaves her head, then if it was lust, that lust will die out and you're going to leave her alone. But if you really loved her, then even with her head shaved, you'll still desire her, but you give her a full month, you don't touch her sexually, then you marry her and you have sex with her but if you divorce her, you send her out. Why is this law superior to the law of your God and prophet when your God and prophet said you can take a married captive woman and have sex with her and then sell her off? And can I just read the Quranic verse again? Go ahead. And just... I gave you the link to the, the hadith, the context. So read it one more time. Compare the true God of Moses with your God. Read chapter 4, verse 24. One more time. Also forbidden are married women except female captives in your possession. Wow. Wait. So here it says, if there's a married woman, you can't touch her except she's a female captive. You want me to read the Hadith again? Yes. Okay. And let me give you the link in case you missed it the first time. Here it is. Here's the Hadith. Would, they, would you not have to marry? Uh, no. The, no. Uh, or, so it's right here. The Hadith. I'm telling you, no. You can have sex with her and then you can sell her off. Here, let me read it again. 
Abu Sayyid Al Khudri, I gave you the link in the Skype comment section. For the rest of you, I put it in, in the chat. Abu Sayyid Al Khudri, and it's Sahih, it's sound, Al Albani. It's narrated by multiple hadith collectors. It's not just him. Abu Sayyid Al Khudri said, The Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Altas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions, Sahaba of the Apostle of Allah, were reluctant to have relations, doesn't say marriage, have sex, relations, that's the word, with the female captains because of their pagan husbands. So Allah the Exalted said down the chronic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you. And the context is not about who you can't have sex with, not done about marriage, if you read verse 23. Okay, now let me read again. And Allah sent down the chronic verse, all married women are forbidden unto you, save those whom your right hands possess. That is to say, they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. Make sure they're not pregnant. And if they're not pregnant, you can go into them. Doesn't say marry them. You can have relations with them and then you can do what you want with them. Sell them or keep them. And the husbands are still alive. What kind of God does this? Because now you have two problems. Number one, he's sanctioning adultery. Number two, for all intents and purposes, it's rape. Because I want you to convince me. Convince me a woman who's married, whose husband is still alive, taken captive, would voluntarily, willfully want to have sex with her captor. Any sane woman want to do that? If her husband's still alive? Yeah, it's right there. It says in front of the pagan husbands. Uh, probably not. Come on, man. Any decent woman who's just been attacked and had family relatives or whatever killed, and a man jumps on her and wants to have sex with her, she can say, oh, yeah, oh, I'm so excited. I was waiting. No decent moral woman would want to have sex. And there's nothing in the Quran or in the Hadith that says you got to get her permission because she belongs to you. She is your possession. The literal Arabic isn't female captive. It's those that your right hands possess. That's the Arabic. That's why in the Hadith, notice how it's translated. Let me read it one more time. So Allah exalted sent down the chronic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those whom your right hand possess. That is an Arabic idiom meaning that which you own and possess. So here, this woman, you own her. That means she has no say-so in the matter. And you're okay with this? <sighs> exactly. My friend, you made a big mistake leaving atheism for Islam. Keep seeking the face of God. Keep watching my videos. Watch Christian Prince as well. And David Wood, watch these videos. And Lord willing, call me tomorrow. We'll talk more because I gave you too much information and I want to blow you away. But now, before you, we get off the subject, let me ask you a question. Since you were drawn to the worship the way they worship in the mosque. Are you also drawn to kissing and smothering a black stone like Muhammad did when he made the pilgrimage to Mecca, which is sunnah that you have to do? If you go to uh, perform hajj or umrah, which you must do once in your lifetime, you have to perform yes. the rites of pilgrimage. So you run around the Kaaba seven times. You run between Safa and Marwa seven times. Then you throw stones at the Wadi Mina, you know, stones, seven That's stones, it. I believe. And also, you must, if it's not too numerous, kiss the black stone and touch it like Muhammad did. And there's a hadith, and I can give it to you now if you want. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, when he went to kiss it, he goes, I know you're a stone that neither harms nor benefits. Had I, I not seen Allah's messenger kiss you, I would not kiss you. So why did your prophet smooch a black stone? Um... I asked my imam this, and he says uh, it fell from uh, it fell from the heavens. And you were you you believe that you would you he duped you to believe? I don't want to say you're dope. I'm not trying to disrespect you. You actually believe Allah? Well, yeah. Well, you believe Allah anyway, because he's supposedly the God of Abraham. The God of Abraham sent a black stone for people to smother and kiss it. A black stone that was white that became black because of the sins of the people kissing it. I mean, I believed it, yeah. Okay, so wait. Believe Understand what you said. So it turned black because of your sins, right? Yes. That means it absorbed white, your yeah. sins, right? Yeah. So a black stone can absorb your sins, but Jesus can't bear your sins and die for your sins. Yeah, you guys make sense. 
You, you're, you, you guys make perfect sense. Jesus dying on the cross for your sins to save you, that's anathema, but a white stone sucking up your sins and turning black from your sins, absorbing your sins so you can be forgiven, that makes sense. Oh, wow, I'm ready to take shahada. You see how, how stupid that sounded? Yeah, I think it's because they would say, oh, well, God couldn't die, right? So forget the fact that he's God who died. A human being who's righteous, voluntarily dies for his sins, you condemn. But a white stone sent down from Allah that becomes darkened, blackened from the sins of those who kiss it in order to absorb their sins so Allah can forgive and atone. You're okay with that. And Islam somehow makes more sense than Christianity. Yep, I'm a believer. Not, you see the problem, right? Yeah. And you had no problem like said, with I, believing this. I can see your point. I think what really uh, drew me to Islam, like I said, it was the culture. I liked the culture. I liked, uh, I thought it was very masculine. I, I liked the worship and the brotherhood was good and, and stuff like this. All right. Well, uh, you sure the brotherhood? Okay, hold on, my friend. Now that you've been in Islam for two years. Don't tell me you're blind to the division and the backbiting and the attacks within the Muslims themselves. Yes, there's a lot of, uh, there is some fighting, yeah. Some? Not only Sunni and Shia, but you have the Salafi attacking the, uh, the Ashari and the Maturidi. And within Salafis attacking one another, even in Speaker's Corner, like Shemzi and Muhammad Hijab. My friend, it's not some. They're not as united as you were deceived into thinking. They're very disunited. And I know you're seeing it now, right? Yeah. Okay, so that means your reasons for converting were all the wrong reasons. And if there is a God, and there is, you're risking your eternal life because culturally it made sense to me and I like the unity. And now you see they're not as united as you thought. And it's not just Shia and Sunni. There are fac factions in Sunni Islam where even in certain Sunni mosques, certain Sunnis won't be allowed to pray. Come on, man. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. But I just sent you some links. Those three articles, it's going to talk about what we just discussed in brief. Muhammad sanctioning the raping of captive women, even married women. And then it also talks about something else Muhammad did that was very immoral. And I'm sure you heard of it. Muhammad, according to the Sunnis, it's abrogated now. The Shias still observe it. Zawaj al -Muta. Temporary marriage. Have you heard of that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And you're okay with that? That your prophet actually sanctioned that for a while? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I wouldn't do it personally. I don't care what you would do. Your prophet allowed men to go up to a woman and say, I'll marry you for three days and I'll pay you money when I'm done and divorce you. Convince me that's not prostitution. That's not treating a woman like yeah. And you still follow this man. So I want you to think of a hypothetical situation. Just think hypothetically. You're living at the time of Muhammad. Your, your mother is widowed and your sister is single. Muhammad's companions or Muhammad himself comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to marry your mother and Umar is going to marry your sister for three days. When we're done, we're going to divorce them and give them money. Would you be okay with that? No. And you still follow this man. My goodness, you have such great faith to follow some, someone so filthy and wicked and immoral. But think about these things, unless you have another question. Do you have another question, or you want to come back tomorrow? I'll come back tomorrow. Okay, God willing, you have my Skype. You have these articles. Study them. Think about what they said. And any more objections, feel free to bring them up. I'll be here to answer, Lord willing, tomorrow. Okay, thanks, sir. Anytime, sure. buddy. May God guide you to the truth in Jesus' name. Take care.